Welcome to the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jamie Boggs, Vice President of Athletics at Grand Canyon University. Jamie, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, for those that are not familiar with GCU, Grand Canyon University, can you start us off by just maybe profiling both the institution and the athletic department uh, as far as things like, you know, the type of institution, the size, where you're all located, and then really the basics of athletics of just the conference and number of sports or student athletes? Yeah, um, Grand Canyon University is a private Christian university. Uh, We are located right in the heart of Phoenix. Uh, We have about 24,000 students on campus um, and about 50,000 of those are actually living on campus, which is great for uh, for athletics. Uh, We have a very strong academic student body. Um, I think our incoming class uh, this year has an average uh, GPA of 3.6. We are also very diverse as a student body. Um, We have among our student body and our faculty and staff, actually, we are about 45% 45 diverse. Um, I like to tell everyone that over half of our vice presidents here are women. And as I jokingly tell our president, I, I believe that's a secret to his success. Uh, although, <laughs> although we know that it's, it's his vision and leadership that really is, is what's driving all of this. Um, we are uh, members of the Western Athletic Conference, um, as you, you may know, has just recently expanded uh, July 1st to include um, Stephen F. Austin, uh, Sam Houston State, um, Abilene Christian and Lamar University. And we'll add Southern Utah next year, but um, really excited to have those schools join our conference. They really uh, raise the profile of our conference pretty quickly. Um, and uh, we have 380 student athletes around that um, number and 21 sports. And I'm really proud to say that those programs did an unbelievable job this past year of earning us 11 conference championships. <laughs> um, as a university, as a whole, we have a very strong culture of community and service here. And that's really rooted in our Christian mission. Yeah. And um, uh, people think that, you know, Oklahoma and Texas started the conference realignment. I think the WAC uh, has something to say about that. I had the Southern Utah um, outgoing president on the podcast the first uh, in the second season. And and he was uh, great to learn more about his institution. Uh, He also hosted a podcast. So Mm -hmm. I got to learn about that school. So I'm excited to see the WAC expand. And I'm sure you all are going to continue your successes that you've had uh, recently. And you know, one thing that I've I've paid attention to is that GCU. Some may know it outside of athletics because, in reality, there's also uh, 90,000 students online in comparison to you know about the 25,000 you had mentioned that are on campus mm-hmm. in Phoenix. So I have to ask, and maybe this is something that is in the process um, uh, that uh, you all may be considering, but Has there been a strategy to kind of leverage your recent athletic success as a D1 school, which we'll get to about the transition, to kind of convert those online students and those online alumni to, you know, basically become Lopes fans? Well, um, yeah, I'm going to flip this on you a little bit. I actually think the more interesting thing is that we were a university of only 1,000, about 1,000 on campus not that long ago. And now, <laughs> about 12 years later, we have 24,000 uh, on campus. And, and so, yes, our online is also growing exponentially alongside our, our traditional campus. Um, but, you know, we are a very community um, strong. We have a strong community here, and community is such a big part of who we are at DCU. So we encourage and try to engage with all of our students. Um, whether online or um, on campus. And so um, we, we've, uh, in, you know, we, we have a, just as an example, we have a Lopes on the Road initiative that's been in place for several years. And so that when we, that's when we go and travel with certain teams to different cities. And when we go there, we will invite our online students and our online alumni. And it's been very successful. And um, we have some great supporters who are from our, um, from online. Um, all of our athletics communications includes everybody. Uh, we send it out to everybody and we'll even have targeted communication again when we when we travel to different uh, different cities where we can um, can con- continue to connect with our online students. So, but yeah, they are, you know, again, we're all about community. So um, we're engaging our online students just as much as anyone else. And we want them 
to, to be a part of this community. And they are all at, on the flip side, they're really important for us. We have some of our strongest supporters who are uh, from, from online. So we keep, we're looking forward to continuing engaging with them. But yeah, that has always been, I will call it a strategy. It's just who we are. We're always been inclusive in community. Yeah, it seems um, uh, just like an incredible, I mean, we see some of these larger schools that have an online uh, following that, that it seems like the bigger story is really the growth of your on campus. And, and I know a lot of that was done before you had arrived at GCU, but I'm sure you, you've seen some of it in your time there. I mean, what was kind of the, what was the, there was a huge investment, which we'll get to your athletic facilities uh, in a little bit, but what was it like to seeing the, the institution kind of grow up as far as the enrollments that quick? I mean, it's been incredible. And, and actually, I'm from Phoenix. So I was here when the campus was uh, uh, very modest. <laughs> that was a very modest campus. Um, and um, and I, I actually used to come here for uh, for um, singing and piano lessons, <laughs> which is strange. But um, to see it grow and, and see something like this university grow in my hometown, um, in this community. And I grew up um, not that far from here, a few miles from here, uh, but to see it be such a big part and grow with this community has been uh, just really special. Um, I feel privileged and honored to be a part of it. And I hope to actually contribute and for athletics to be a huge part of the growth. Which I would argue it's a huge piece of the, the component of growth and, and sustainability moving forward. You, know, you were serving as the interim AD in 2019, heading into the pandemic, and then uh, announced as the permanent vice president of athletics at the end of April uh, 2021. And I think a lot of us lost our sense of time because of the pandemic. But what do you think you learn most about, it could be about GCU or college athletics in general during COVID-19 that will help you lead GCU permanently as the uh, vice president uh, moving forward? Yeah, um, I, GCU did just such a tremendous job during uh, the pandemic, and I think I learned have learned more from GCU um, than anywhere that is going to help um, us lead this athletics program. Um, you know, those are some unprecedented circumstances that happened. You know, no one predicted a pandemic, and the way the university got together, um, very student centered, uh, very driven towards the same goal, on the same page, collaborative. Um, everyone pitching in to help in different areas. Um, I think it's one of the reasons that we were able to get through it fairly seamlessly. And for our athletic programs, that meant we were able to practice and to compete um, as to as normal a level as possible compared, especially compared to other institutions. And I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons we were so successful this past year as far as the conference championships. Um, but I, I attribute that. Um, and give credit to to the university for for how they got together. Um, you know, it, it all goes back to the culture here, and, and you'll hear me talk about the culture a lot because it's so strong. And I call it the four C's: uh, collaboration, community, um, continuous improvement, and Christian leadership. And those are the things that really the core of of how we get things done here. Um, and as far as leading the athletics program, you know, a lot of what we focused on this past year is aligning ourselves with the greater culture of the university and bringing that into our department. And, and I've told everyone, those are our four C's. We're gonna to continue to enforce those and support that and foster it and live by it. And our job as an athletics program is to one more C and that's championships. So I think we're set up to do that, but um, we are very fortunate to have a very visionary president who I will say till I'm blue in the face is the greatest mind in higher education. And he surrounded himself by some brilliant people and uh, I've been very blessed to learn a lot from them. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, before the, before I, I listened to your press conference and, and the, the fifth C. So uh, I think you all, are, from looking at your improvements of your sports, uh, I don't think the fifth C is that far away from collecting <laughs> several of them. And uh, before the AD position, you had served as the deputy AD for several years at GCU and you also were senior level administrator at, at Georgia State and Duke. And I'm just kind of curious, uh, trying to get more tactical advice for people this, uh, this season on the podcast. What is it like going from a position of influence and sharing the advice and suggestions with your athletic director to then becoming that athletic director? And now you're the one that collects advice and opinions, but you ultimately have to make that, that final decision. What was that kind of uh, that that transition like? Well, you know, I think um, going through a lot of that here at GCU was a great transition for me. 
uh, because everything we do here, including all our decision making, is collaborative. It's a collaborative process, and that's the way it should be. I think sometimes, maybe when you're new into that chair, you don't realize that. <laughs> you maybe make decisions kind of in, in a vacuum. Um, but here, that's just in the culture of, and that's how we did things from when the time I was WAD till now. Um, and so, you know, athletics is a very visible part of the university. We touch several areas around campus and um, any decisions that are made regarding athletics, um, you know, can impact many stakeholders. And so, you know, you have to be collaborative in, in the decision making process and, and fortunate that that's how it's always been and that's how it will continue to be. Um, and I think that'll help me anywhere, you know, <laughs> hopefully here for a really long time. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, I think again, that just that process of, going through that here at GCU was really helpful for me. Well, one thing we've seen with AD hires is, uh, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic and maybe um, we've seen more in-house, I think, promotions to the permanent AD role, I think probably more than we had in the past. I've been a part of schools where we hired, you know, the ADs or head coaches as a kind of a succession plan for someone retiring or leaving. Uh, I'm kind of curious that, what you can do if you're a senior level administrator for those out there that you're doing obviously the best job you can in your current job. Like that's the most important piece because if you don't do that, it's detrimental to, to the team and to your career. But how do you actually make it known or do you need to make it known if you uh, want to be an athletic director one day to do you take on more responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Are you just asking questions, you know, more questions of people uh, in those roles? Like how do you prepare while you're doing your job to kind of collect those uh, experiences to make it known you ultimately want to be the be an AD, whether it be there or at you know another institution. Yeah, you know I think by the time you're um, by the time you're at a senior level role, you probably have enough experience on your um, from a on your resume from a skill set standpoint to gain what you need for that next level. Um, but you know what makes kind of that difference to me is is the leadership, um, and so you know. My advice would be focus, you know, once you get to that point, focus less on what you can add to your resume um, and focus more on figuring out how you can better serve people. Um, you know, because you do, you need the experience and you do need the skill set. Um, but being an effective athletic director requires a tremendous amount of leadership, and leadership requires um, serving others. Uh, I think people get really fixated. Um, on adding things to the resume, on reading leadership books, on attending every possible professional development opportunity. And those things are all helpful and good, but ultimately you, you, you've got to learn to be a leader. Um, and, and the great thing about that though, is you can do it at any level. You, you can be an entry level um, person and, and focus on leadership, but it's really just the action of, of having a servant mindset and figuring out how to serve others that really takes you to that next step. Um, you know, instead of what can I do to raise myself up and, and make myself known as, a, as that next AD, what can you do to build your staff up and develop your staff and raise them? Um, instead of figuring out how to get credit um, for this work that you just accomplished, how can you give credit to others and raise them up? And it's hard. It's hard because you're like eager for that next step. Um, but ultimately, it's the leadership that separates that senior level person um, from the athletic director. I am. I I see the point there for sure. I, I also could see someone thinking, well, how does if I'm one of you know six or seven senior level administrators, and we've all been there same amount of time, we're in our own areas. Mm -hmm. How do you? How would you make it known that that's a role you're interested in? Because some people might not want to ever be an AD, mm -hmm. and they might just want to focus on their job. I mean, how do? How would you recommend someone do that if they're, um, you know, part of a bigger athletic department? Or is it the same principle where you don't need to say you are interested or you're not? Just keep doing your job, and if the opportunity comes up. Well, no, I think uh, if you do want to be an athletic director, because you're right, some people don't want to. Um, Which but, is totally fine if you if yeah. you're if you're happy being a, a, a just part of the senior staff. I don't think everyone needs to be that's an AD. I 100% agree with you, and and you you do have to communicate that that's you know your ultimate goal, um, you know. But I think ultimately, what decides whether or not you get there or not um, is is you know is the leadership piece. And um, I think all leaders and you know the presidents and you know the people who hire 
Um, they see that, they know what they had to go through to, to, to get into that role. And it does require a lot of self-sacrifice. Um, putting, you know, I use, um, the thing that has helped me a lot is, you know, I turn to my faith and it's hard. You know, it, it's, it can be draining, emotionally, physically draining to, to get into that next step and to, to hold that, um, the, the position of the athletic director. But I always use them. I'm going to quote a verse, Philippians 2, 3. I try to live by it every day and I fail. I fail it every day. But it's uh, um, <laughs> um, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Um, um, and it's hard, but that's that's what I focus on. And um, you can really see it too in your staff. You can see it when there's a really true desire to serve others. So, so um, yes, communicate it, but really focus on on um, developing your leadership. I came from, um, I took today off because I uh, needed to use some vacation days before the school year starts. And I just came from Bible study before this. So I'm going to have to write that one down and, and uh, look at it. So uh, with a couple of my friends and um, no, that's great. Uh, I always love hearing those type of principles too, uh, to be, to be involved in decision-making and, and uh, you know, I kind of want to kind of move to another tactical thing, which is more department and institution wide and not so much on just the athletic director, but in 2012, GCU announced they were accepting a bid to join the WAC and transition to D1, mm -hmm. which really went alongside your growth as an institution, it sounds like, but you all became active member in 2017. So it is a long process, but you, you joined as an interesting time and in your institution's athletic uh, department uh, program. And for those listening that are unaware, what type of changes typically have to go on uh, when you transition into division one? And what was that experience like for you and your GCU colleagues to actually go through it and then finally become a full member of uh, in 2017? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the transition from D2 to D1 is not just an athletics transition. It's the transition of an entire university. Um, so that can be challenging. Um, you know, within athletics, yes, you need to build out your compliance, your academics, you need to build out a budget, you need to build out a marketing plan, you need to make sure you're sustainable and can be a nationally competitive Division One program. Um, but you also have to make sure there's oversight, um, institutional oversight over the athletics program. So just as a small example, um, compliance, you have to make sure that eligibility certification is monitored by someone outside of athletics. So you're basically telling someone or communicating with someone that doesn't report to you, isn't under your umbrella, hey, you have some additional responsibilities because of athletics uh, that I need to add to your plate that's going to use your resources, your people, and your time. And so uh, that doesn't always go well. And I've, I've been through a transition before. And so when I started that at GCU, I was, I was ready. I was ready to meet with people across campus. I had my violation reports ready as examples. I had my bullet points. I was ready for an argument or at least some kind of error, adversarial response. Um, but again, GCU is very collaborative. And so I remember meeting with our two executive vice presidents over compliance, kind of the financial aid areas. And uh, when I told them what we needed, um, their immediate response was, Okay, let me make sure I understand. And um, when do I need to start this? There was there was no fight. I, I almost didn't know how to respond. I was in such shock. <laughs> but every person that I met with across GCU had the same response. And so, you know, it was great. It was a great experience for me to come at that time because I really got a quick understanding of GCU's culture, which is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Um, and just so collaborative, so um, student-centered and just everyone's there to do the right things and the best thing for the university. So it was a good experience. Yeah, I, I've worked, my career is split between D2 and D1. And so uh, I was at University of Indianapolis for uh, over three years and then went to IU and I've done eligibility at both places. And it, it really is a, even that process is, is an eye opening for a registrar's office. Like, what do you mean you need to know <laughs> progress towards degree percentage and, and what is APR? And, and, and it's, it's just it's uh, completely different. Completely it, different. It, it really yeah. is. And I mean, it's still important to D2, but you're also, you're just looking at totally mm -hmm. don't do percentage in D2. So it's a, it's a big difference. That's a big violation if you don't do it correctly. So, That's right. yeah. Uh, now, another part of that, I think, was the uh, 10 and 2 initiative to build 10 on-campus athletic facilities in two years. 
And I've seen that I've seen pictures. Can't wait to visit in, in person and check them out. But can you walk us through? Was that kind of a full fledged? We're going all in on the D1 uh, transition, and and it obviously helped grow the footprint of the institution. But can you walk us also through that? It sounds like aggressive and maybe controlled chaos, maybe <laughs> both um, uh, from an athletic facilities uh, forefront. Yeah, so the initiative, which was building 10 athletic facilities in two years, it sounds really aggressive. And I'm not sure there's, we try to look it up, but I don't know if there's any other university that is, has, done, has done that in such a short period of time. Um, and, but the, the thing about it um, is that it was just a small part of a larger plan. And I don't mean to minimize it at all by saying just or small, but um, it was part of a one and a half billion dollar investment into the academic infrastructure of campus. So it was definitely planned. You know, everything we do here at DCU is, is data driven and student centered. It was planned, um, but it wasn't a, it was a part of a bigger plan. Um, that one and a half billion dollar investment including included building 27 unbelievable residence halls, um, an engineering building, a STEM building, the Canyon Activity Center, which was 10 um, full-size basketball courts where we hosted the NCAA's first uh, player development academy. It's an incredible building. Um, but all these things were built um, and invested in during that same time. So we just focused on the small piece of it that was athletics and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, it was incredible. And, and to have the facilities that we have, I think they're some of the best in the country. We are so thankful and so grateful. But again, part of our president's bigger vision of investing into this campus and building a very robust um, student-centered uh, campus that, that where he was investing in everything from academics to athletics to student, you know, student engagement. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it was chaos by any means because um, it was such a huge plan that was put in place. But again, just part of the vision and just this growing footprint of, of VCU. Well, if you, uh, so I did spend a year as a grad assistant in athletics at Nova Southeastern University in, in uh, South Florida, and it was a D2 school, but there was 22,000 students, I want to think. But it was kind of inverted where it was, it had a medical, it was known as like a professional school. So it had law school, medical school. And um, so I think 18 of the 22,000 were, were grad and doctoral students, but it was D2. And I was like, you know, this this is, it was a very unique D2 school. And so if you all would have not gone D1 and still, you know, had this growth as an institution, you'd really be out there on an island of your own, like uh, just a, just not a, as compatible D2. So I think it all like, now I'm hearing it from you and some of the research I did, it, it does seem like it's been lockstep with the institution plan of this growth mm -hmm. because the growth is just something that I don't think we've seen in higher education in modern day, at least where it went from that size. And like you said, I don't think there's, if there's been 10 buildings uh, in two years put up for athletic facilities in addition to academics, 27 residence halls, uh, that just seems like something that does not happen very often. Uh, I don't think that it's happened. We probably would have read about it on the D1 ticket right now. <laughs> I agree. No, it is very impressive. Um, and uh, again, it's just, um, it's just amazing to be a part of this university. I've never seen anything like it, uh, but everyone's driving in the same direction. And we're also proud of what this university has done and, and for this community too. And that's the other thing that we haven't even gotten to, but the, the investment in the community um, it, to help this community around us grow. Service is such a big part of who we are. Um, and so uh, it's just been great for, for, for the students that have gone here, that are coming here now and for, and for the people in the surrounding community. So is... Um a lot of campuses right now are, are under construction is is most of the construction is like most things built or they're still like is there still building going on on the academic enterprise we are still continuing our growth uh it, you know there's kind of a running joke people call us grand construction university uh but our enrollment's growing so with our enrollment growing our campus has to grow um so yeah we are we have an unbelievable uh residence hall being built um, on one side of campus called the river. So we're excited to see what will happen with that. But there are so many um, great uh, buildings across campus that are going up and um, I don't I can't, it's hard to even keep track of them. I just know every time we come back from a long trip, something else pops up or something else is knocked down so something else can be popped up, <laughs> so. Yeah, because it, well, it makes sense because in, in 
you all are probably just going to keep growing because if you keep providing a great residential experience and you have all these students online, yeah. I want to, I'll go back to that. And, and um, I just have a feeling that more of these students are going to love the online version, but they're going to be exposed with these communications. Mm -hmm. And as GCU residential grows, I mean, the online will probably say the same, but more of them will probably also kind of, uh, I guess you say move over to the residential footprint of campus. So it seems like it's almost unlimited that you might have another 10 and two where you, you, you <laughs> might need to build, you might just go on this whole expanding your athletic facilities uh, to accommodate all the fans that you might might bring. That, you know, that's our goal. We love engaging with our, uh, with our fans and our community. So well, as we start to wrap up, I, I did want to touch on something that kind of goes back to you as an individual. Uh, as far as I've seen this trend of athletic directors with uh, compliance and, you know, JD backgrounds, law school backgrounds, and this, the early story of your career seems to fit that mold too. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. I started my career in compliance. I didn't go to law school. I decided to go at uh, academic route uh, or uh, higher education, but what skill sets do you think that you all get in that law school education and that compliance background, why is that becoming such a good toolkit for athletic directors? Because it seems like a lot of them are being hired. We just saw uh, uh, Missouri hire, um, yeah. fire uh, her too. And, and we've seen like a lot of law school yes. uh, JD people come into the industry. Yes, I actually believe we went to the same law school. So ironically, I think um, I, when I was in law school, she came to speak to my law school class. So that was fun to see. It's really fun to see uh, Desiree um, continue to grow. Um, she, she's phenomenal, a phenomenal leader. So um, yeah, I think one of the things from law school that has really helped me is um, issue spotting, being able to identify issues. And again, I go back to uh, how athletics touches every part of a university. And so our decisions impact, can impact so many things. So you have to really be able to think ahead and spot potential issues um, and stay in front of them. Uh, so that has been really helpful. But the other thing is just communication. Um, I think a lot of, I don't know if it's people that go to law school tend to be effective communicators or you learn to be, to be effective communicator when we get there or both. Um, but you really do have to learn um, to communicate and to cater a message to to your audience, uh, and those those are all skill sets that I I learned in 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 law school. Uh, but from a compliance standpoint, and I know you'll understand this, um, but I think um, relationship building is something that you really learn from being in compliance. Uh, because we're not like the fundraiser. We don't go in and say, hey, guess what? We got a million dollars for your project. You know, we're either going in because something went wrong, there's a violation, or we're going to say no. <laughs> um, and so it's really critical to have positive, good relationships with the people that you're working with. And I think, um, and, and with people around campus. So I think that was such a, a strong, um, something that was really important that I think I learned from the, uh, from being in, in compliance for so long. Yeah. One of my friends and colleagues is um, uh, in compliance is, is leaving for an NCOA position. And I joke with him that I've got to go back through all my emails of him just to learn his email writing style because he went to law school and he's compliance and I, I just like you know these the way you send interps the way you send bad news like I I, I credit myself being a, a good writer and effective communicator but um, I did joke that like I'm going to kind of have to steal that um, that <laughs> style of writing bad news uh, or it's just it is effective and and uh, how to do interps I mean it's it's something I guess it is a law school thing because I didn't I didn't pick that part up. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder the last thing about this is, do you suspect that with that skill set of the law background, the compliance background, um, do you think that we're going to continue with all the challenges coming to higher education and college athletics that that's still going to be maybe the next trend or continued trend of uh, the next generation of vice presidents, athletic directors? Um, I think that we'll continue to see people who are strong executives and have strong executive management skills, because that's what that role is. I think the term athletic director probably sounds a little bit confusing, but it really, it's a vice president or associate vice president role. And just like any other executive on campus, you, you need to have the same skill sets, uh, visionary, um, leadership skills, uh, uh, decision-making, strategic planning, 
um, issue spotting, change management, management skills, um, staff development, those are all things that are critical to this role. You know, I think, you know, back a long time ago, it was, you know, the athletic director was someone who could communicate well with, with coaches, um, or it's just someone who's, uh, you know, primarily good at fundraising or primarily good at, you know, one thing or another. And it, that just can't, that's just not how this industry, this position and this role is, is it set up. You know, you really need to be um, able to have executive management skills to effectively, uh, to, to effectively be um, an athletic director. Especially at an institution that wants to be like yours, where it seems like it, it is truly just so closely aligned yeah. uh, with the institution at a, at a time like yours all with the growth. Mm -hmm. um, the, there, there, one question I like to ask people is there's no shortage of challenges facing the industry right now, but you know, in my line of work, I thought the transfer evaluation any other year or transfer uh, rule would have been like the biggest news ever. And it kind of just scooted by with everything else going on. Um, but what is maybe an issue that we're not paying enough attention to that is maybe creeping along inside college athletics uh, that we really need to make sure we don't lose sight of uh, amidst all the noise of uh, things like NIL and conference realignment? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of issues that we are uh, facing right now in college athletics. I think we're going through a very uh, transformational time in our industry, and I think that's good. I think um, you can't have progress without change. Um, I think if there are two things that I, I think about often um, that really more affect higher education, which then um, affects um, college athletics, um, there's two things. And I, there are two things that I think GC does a really good job of addressing. And the first is access to affordable education. Um, over the last, who knows how many decades, um, the cost of tuition it continues to go up and um, to the point where it might either not be accessible or when you finish with your um, degree, you have a tremendous amount of student loans um, and you're already behind. Um, you can't, you can't uh, maybe buy a house when you, need, when you want to, you can't invest, um, you can't really do the things you need to do to have your long-term financial security because of the cost of education. Um, and so, you know, I think GCU has been a really, done a really good job of having a model that allows us to freeze tuition, has allowed us to freeze tuition for the past 13 years, uh, which is unheard of. Um, and I think that's the reason that we are so diverse and have um, students across our campus that, I mean, students across the socioeconomic spectrum um, on our campus from some of the wealthiest families in Scottsdale to um, maybe not so um, affluent uh, neighbor students from other neighborhoods, um, but that's important. That's a need in our in our country to have affordable, accessible education. Um, the second thing is that there are truly families and students out there that are seeking Christian education, and a place where they can grow their faith, where they can comfortably talk about it, um, and that's not common anymore. You, we don't have that. Um, and so for GCU to be able to provide private Christian affordable education, uh, we're in a welcoming and inclusive environment, that's really an anomaly in this industry, or I don't know if anomaly or rarity is, is the better term, um, but it's also a need. So I think GCU serves a really big need um, in higher education. I hope that there are 20 more of us out there um, that can help serve this need in higher education. And putting those two together is is even more rare because as a private school, and um, which a lot of privates are, you know, religiously uh, faith based, but it, it can also come with a price of being very expensive. So the fact that you just your institution can combine those two, I know that's the type of place I would want my almost. I'm about to have another third and final baby boy here in a few weeks, and that's uh, the type of setting that I hope that they find. Uh, you know, uh, 15 to 20 years from now. So that's great to hear. Yes, and you're uh, not alone in that. So, uh, you know, again, I hope there's more of us out there. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, um, which is another great reason why you have the online and the big uh, residential <laughs> campus, right? So right. You know, I want to I want to end it. This It seems like this last question I wrote down really summarizes a lot of the stuff we've talked about, mm -hmm. which um, I think will uh, be a great one to end on is, what vision do you have and your staff have for GCU athletics 
moving forward, let's say, you know, 10, 15 years from now, and then how do you and your staff day-to-day carry out that vision um, to actually, you know, do that for your student athletes and for your institution? Yeah, well, our vision really is to catch up our athletics program with the rest of the university, which, you know, as I've, I've mentioned throughout this, the conversation has grown exponentially in a short period of time. So we want to win, consistently win conference championships and progress to winning national championships uh, quickly, uh, just like our university has. And we have everything um, in place to do that. We have state-of-the-art facilities. Some of ours are some of the best in the country. Um, we have a, a very strong fan base, very strong community support, um, arguably one of the best student sections in the country. I mean, and most importantly, we have a very committed, supportive, visionary president. So we have everything it takes. Uh, we already have won a record 11 conference championships this past year. And so every year we wanna take it to the next level. Um, so that's our vision. And, and we also you know, wanna make sure that we use this platform of athletics to really represent GCU the way it deserves to be represented. Well, I can't let you go without uh, expanding on the student section thing, because we did talk about before I started the recording and I looked into a little bit what I mean, what is um, there's like a whole like organization around it. It seems like student organization and it's probably a really hot item to get a ticket for. Uh, Can you expand on that student section for your games? So our Havocs. Yes, our Havocs. I, I, I will say this a million times. The best student section in the country. Uh, They are so great. And again, it's we have a, such a strong sense of community here. So they are truly out there to support, uh, to support the programs. Um, they're out there to have fun. Our environment is fun. <laughs> you know, it's not just about the basketball; it's about the experience, and they make it such a great experience. But they're they're student driven. They come up with the ideas. We work with them collaboratively, and it's a, it's a you know there's several people across campus, but it's student driven, uh, and it's amazing when you when students are are given the you know, leeway uh, to, to be creative and, and when we give them the support, um, it's amazing what people can do. So, um, you know, it just, we have such a strong culture to have, um, you know, that type of student support, to have 3,500 um, students um, with that much energy, with that much support, there's already a culture built into that because we've only been division one for what, eight years or something like that. <laughs> and to have that, and it's something that schools that have been division one for a long time are looking for, you know, again, I go back to the same thing. It's that strong culture of community, that support from one another. And on the same on the same end, we want, as athletics, want to support our student body and our havocs and all people across campus. Um, uh, it's just part of our community. Um, but they are unbelievable. They are different. It's not a traditional, it's not kind of the same rowdy crowd you might see at another uh, maybe um, strong student body um, in college athletics. It's just different. It's almost like a party slash rave at a basketball game. It's hard to explain um, and even videos don't do it justice. But again, I would love to invite you over and, and, and have you here to uh, experience um, what we call the biggest party in college basketball. That's saying a lot, which, yeah, I can't wait to, I definitely will take you up on that when I'm in Phoenix, but um, that's saying a lot from someone that for one, I, you know, I'm, we have assembly hall, so we have passionate <laughs> fan base. And then you had a previous stop at Duke. So you had the Cameron uh, crazies. So that's, uh, that's something I can't wait to see then. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how, how much havoc they, uh, they do bring. So uh, Jamie Boggs, Vice President of Athletics, Grand Canyon University. Thanks for sharing a lot about your institution and your athletic department being on the Higher Ed Athletics podcast. Yeah, thank you. Enjoyed it. Look forward to having you here.